Got it. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth from from Empower Survivors, and which this is a Empower Survivors program, Conversations with Elizabeth. Uh, glad to see everybody here. It's always nice to see new people and and our regulars and that sort of thing. But uh, tonight we have some uh, special night ahead of us. We have a special guest, Michael Skinner. Uh, Michael is an award-winning advocate, educator, writer, and critically acclaimed singer, songwriter, guitarist, addressing the issues of trauma abuse and mental health concerns through public speaking, writing, and his music. He has spoken at the National Press Club, was a keynote presenter for a conference held by the United Nations, the State's Department, and Georgetown, Georgetown University, on the sexual exploitation and trafficking of children and adults, and he was part of the groundbreaking Oprah Winfrey shows that addressed the issues of males sexually abused as children. Since 1993, Michael's uplifting and heartwarming story and songs of hope and healing has impacted thousands of people every year throughout the country. His presentations at colleges, universities, high schools, mental health centers and conferences, churches, civil groups, sexual assault and domestic violence, support centers and conferences, including a women's correctional center in Hawaii are highly acclaimed. He has appeared on many TV shows and internet shows and has been the subjects of many news articles regarding child abuse and mental health. Michael is also a frequent and sought after blogger in several webs on several websites and writers of I I'm sorry here. I always have to mess it up a little bit, right? Um, of articles for mental health publications. He has contributed chapters for three books, The Doors to Freedom, Live Your Life from Today, Our Encounters with Suicide, and You Can Help, A Guide for Family and Friends of Survivors of Sexual Abuse and Assault. Michael is also featured in the film documentary, Hold Me Right, addressing the aftermath of sexual abuse. His role as a consultant and trainer for the federal government's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors has been crucial in helping to shape the policy initiatives and directives for the delivery and implementation of trauma-informed care and services. And he has worked with organizations nationwide to address the stigma of mental health and ending the silence of child abuse and suicide. Michael is also the founder and director of The Surviving Spirit, a monthly newsletter and website sharing resources to help those impacted by trauma and abuse and mental health challenges. So please check that out. You can sign up for his uh, newsletter and uh, he has a lot of great information on there so I suggest that everybody checks it out and I will put that link in the chat but with that welcome Michael nice to have you here well thank you thanks for having me here thank you folks for being here um, it's great to be here but it's always a strange <laughs> disconnect when you're doing a performance via zoom I still absolutely understand fully mastered that yet. I still miss you know, <laughs> people, but it's great to have this platform because then we can reach people. So tonight, um, given, well, you've seen, you just said all that. Why don't we just have a conversation now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, folks, Elizabeth and I were talking because she said um, to have me on. I said, why don't we you know, do some music and some chatting? And I thought, why don't I share some lessons learned? And now, it's not everything I've learned in since I've been at this since 1993, but I'm just going to share some snippets, but I'm really going to really try to let the music do the talking because I'm a musician, I'm a songwriter, and in my songs, they reflect, you know, the things I've gone through, whether that, you know, the, the sadness, but also the joy, the peace, the love, and everything else that I found in between. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. So again, it's... Um, lessons learned but i'm going to share songs and you know what what was the genesis of writing the song and how it came about so elizabeth i have to make a shorter bio for you 
<laughs> well, you sent me that, and I could have right. taken pieces out, but you know, that? I had to. I needed to fumble over words and 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 that sort of thing. So <laughs> people were starting to fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, now they know how great you are and how how much you've done in the advocacy realm and everything else. I mean, you've been a great gift. I well, thank you. But I've been at it since 1993, and I came into this. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say kicking and screaming. It was not the path I chose to do. And as I'm sharing tonight through the songs and then, you know, discuss, you know, what I will share, I'll give you some background why I've kept at this, because uh, if I had had my druthers, I would just, if I could have just gone right back to being a musician and just forget about all this trauma, abuse and mental health stuff. And my platform has always been addressing the trauma, abuse and mental health. I know Empower Survivors is more, you know, for childhood sexual abuse. And so I walk in all the different little camps because I've been impacted by all of them. And again, my platform has always been about hope, healing, and help. So the next, the first song I'm going to open up with is um, Songs for the Keys to Your Life. And that's off my Waiting for a Train CD. And a couple things that I have learned for me, less for me to help in my healing and I learned this from adult children of alcoholics, so I didn't make this up, is, but the three A's, you know, awareness, acceptance, and action. And for me to recognize that the trauma did impact me in my life, and that, but yet I could heal. And one of the things I've learned in my presentations and just being part of things, trauma is not a competition. And we're not here to minimize or compare because I, I hear that all the time. And, you know, a lot of times I was guilty of that myself, minimizing what I went through, you know, looking at someone else in another situation. Your trauma is the worst trauma for you because that's how it's impacted you because it has a unique way of how it, we're all different. So um, it's unique to that individual. And again, becoming trauma informed, um, I've learned, and I'm not asking this question, but I'm thinking, what has, what has happened to someone versus what's wrong with you? Getting away from that mental health paradigm of what's wrong with you there's something you know it's what has happened to you in your life because that is how it has shaped you and how you react a big thing for me helping to learn understand that and if you haven't checked this out but look into the ace aces study adverse childhood experiences and you'll just see that it helps back up all the things that you're going through so because you're not crazy things happen to you so all these physical things can also happen later on so with that said, there's, also, there's a lot of things we can do to help mitigate some of the harms and the damage that was done to us as children or as adults. So I still believe in understanding what happened to me and others, but I also believe that there's hope, there is healing, there is help. So this is Songs for the Keys to Your Life. Rising is all that you see. Once made a goal, nothing so cold. Your hands have forgotten your dreams. Even no, even care. When did you drop the keys? Keys your dreams, your music to your soul. Remember how you once sang to me. Songs are the keys to your life. Songs are the keys to your life. Songs are the keys to your life. Every song or a song are the keys to your life. Wasting away and what fair to say of all the things that you love. Now all I see is broken inside. Love of only your wealth. Let now the dream in liberation and schemes climb the way to the top. Look around, what do you see? A wasteland of all that you love. Songs are the keys to your life. Songs are the keys to your life. Songs are the keys to your life. Every song of the soul. Oh, 
to love Songs are the keys to life Songs are the keys to life Songs are the keys to life And song of the soul The keys to life So that is Songs for the Keys to Your Life, a uh, long title, one of my shortest songs. And part of the writing of this was in my travels and also thinking about myself is how trauma disconnects us from ourselves and from others, and also how it disconnects us from our creativity and our passion, and it leads to isolation. And I saw this in so many... Um, friends or, or just travelers I met in my journeys, uh, and, and myself included, how a lot, so many times we're pushing away the very things that can help us heal, the very things that bring us joy. And I, I've long believed that every one of us is creative. I do. And you don't have to play the guitar or sing or be an artist or writer. There's so many creative endeavors. Do you cook? Do you play in, you know, do you like the flowers, the planting? There's so many things. Um, and the trauma, how it disconnects us from that. So this is, again, one of the lessons that I learned, that which, which is huge for me, because there's been many times I have just walked away and just shut down, and I'm denying the very thing that brings me joy. I've made a living as a drummer and then as a guitar player singer for, for many years. Um, not so much now because I'm older and, and, and then health issues, but I can just enjoy playing. I don't have to make a living for it because it, it's always music has been my life. It, it's what brought me, has brought me joy and it's kept me sane and kept me alive. So for me to deny that because of the trauma and I have, um, it's, not, it's not good for my health. The mind, the body, and the spirit. So that's that's part of why um, how this came about. And and what I've learned from all of this is we need connection. And thank you, Elizabeth, because when you create these platforms, that's helping connect us. So that's that piece. Um, I'm going to do four songs, um, and I chose four because today is April fourth. This is the month of April. It's four. My birthday is 414, and I've always had, I know you, it's better to work in threes, but I said, I'm going to do four. And I thought, I'm going to, yes, because April 14th, I, for most of my life, I always thought of, that was the day Lincoln was shot. So it wasn't a very positive birthday note. Then years later, I learned that it's Richie Blackmore's birthday also. He's the lead guitarist from Deep Purple, one of the most phenomenal guitar players in the world. So that's how I look at April 14th now. It's my birthday, but then down it, it's also Richie Blackmore's birthday. So I don't think of the, the Lincoln anymore. So there was, there's a, some healing there. This next song is called Brush Away Your Tears. And uh, I had been asked, this is a lesson learned. Um, everything to me is several years ago. I was asked to present at a conference being held at Georgetown University. Um, and it was being sponsored by Georgetown University, the State Department and um, the United Nations. And it was addressing trafficking. And I simply said to the person, well, this is great, but why are you asking me to present as a survivor? And, and she simply said, Michael, you were trafficked as a child. And, and she started to tell me what my parents had done. And I just, I dissociated, I it felt like I got a sucker punch to the gut. So that was a major learning lesson because I had always minimized and denied that what had gone on in my life. Um, and I'm not gonna really spend a lot of time in the weeds on that, but I was trafficked as a child. So uh, that was a lesson learned. It was a very painful lesson, but having to address that also helped me in my healing. So um, that is how, so I was called to present. I agreed to, to do this. It was an incredible event, but within two days, I wrote this song. 
um, and I performed it at the event. And so um, it's my take on still how I see the, the world in, in terms of looking at childhood abuse. you wave the tears from your eyes, my child. The world don't want to see you cry. But you wave the tears from your eyes, my child. The world don't want to see you cry. And no, it's not right. You've got to carry on with the life. Please try. The world don't understand, sticks its head in the sand and hides. Wish I could take your hand, try to help you understand, my child. You've got to carry on, your story must be told sometime. Wish away the tears from your eyes, my child. The world don't want to see you cry Brush away the tears from your eyes like a child The world don't want to see you cry When you're standing all alone Reach inside you carry on dear child Find the ways to be strong Though they may break you down inside Your spirit is still alive So look around and you'll find A friend who holds your hand Who try their best to understand your life So to them please carry on Find the ways to be strong, my child Push away the tears from your eyes, my child The world don't want to see you cry Push away the tears from your eyes, my child The world don't want to see you cry Push away your tears Out all of your fears Had all of your pain Had all of your shame The world don't want to know The world don't want to know The world don't want to know The world don't want to Someday the world will understand And then they'll hold out their hand Till then you must be strong And find a way to carry on Push away your tears Push away your tears Away your tears, push away your tears. Whoop, we got a, that was wonderful. You do such a great job, Michael. Thanks. Thanks. Of course, you just didn't start this up yesterday, did you? <laughs> no, I um, I was also honored and I feel blessed that um, the folks who made, it's a very powerful documentary, Boys and Men Healing from uh, Childhood Sexual Abuse. They used the song, in the closing credits, and I was like <laughs> very excited because that was very cool. And the recorded version um, the, with, in the, the, I did in the studio because I have friends on guitar and keyboards and I also put a drum track down. 
But I had several survivor friends come in and they sang the chorus. So that was pretty cool. So, so that's the recorded version. I'll send that to Elizabeth, then she can share it with you folks, the MP3 to that, so. That's awesome, Michael. And, and that's actually, you mentioned, <clears throat> um, was it Boys to Healing? Uh, and I think I've said before, that was the first time that I ever became aware of you was actually watching uh, men's stories and, you know, earlier on in my healing journey. And, and that's how I found out about you and all the rest of the men. And it just, what an excellent, just an excellent documentary. Yeah, it's very powerful. And, and years earlier, they did one on the females. Uh, so that, that was also very powerful. Um, so with this, and as Elizabeth read the, you know, my, my bio, I've, I have been an advocate activist in this, again, since 1993. And there's, there's many reasons why I chose that route. Um, but some of the things that I learned along the way that just kept me going um, was learning, because I, I was always thought, oh, it was just me or maybe a few people, but learning that one in four females and one in six males are sexually assaulted before the age of 18. That's like, wow, <laughs> that's huge. I came from a family of five siblings. I was the oldest. There were four boys and, and my sister. Two of my brothers, you know, succumbed to suicide. Um, so I know full well how devastating that is. I learned that one in five people will deal with a mental health concern or a challenge in their life, yet two thirds will not seek help due to the stigma and discrimination. That was another thing I had to deal with, the stigma and discrimination when I was labeled mentally ill because now I was given a diagnosis of PTSD and back in the day it was major depression. Learning also that depending on which study you say, but anyways, 90%, up to 93 to 95, 96% of folks receiving services at the mental health centers are all dealing with significant trauma. So, and then when you peel back the layers, there's a lot of abuse. So that's where, you know, the song, because um, society doesn't want to know. And unfortunately, too many take the stance of the three monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. And I just want to go as what Amy Good Goodman says, go to where the silence is and say something. Um, I've learned in my travels in speaking and performing, there was a time when I was, I was doing a lot of mental health conferences and it could be 200 people, it could be five or six. Some, some of them had 1,000 to 1,200 people. And this was great because I get to sell CDs, I get to perform. But what happened shortly after I'd been on that track for a while, they all started asking me, can you downplay the abuse? They wanted me to talk about healing from depression and my mental illness, but they did not want me to talk about the abuse. And I've never been graphic. All I've ever said is I was sexually abused as a child. You know, you can draw the, people can connect the dots. I was never graphic. It was my parents and some of their perverted friends. That's as much, but yet I was still being asked not to do that. So needless to say, I just, no, I, I cannot be silent. So that's where, again, why this song brush, it's, we've come along father there's all kinds of great organizations and people speaking out but there's still the mindset of i don't want to hear about it um and what i've learned is we cannot heal in that silence because in ignoring it it's only magnifying our pain and the shame and the blame we feel and we feel maligned again so for myself learning um i needed to purge these toxins that are in my body from all the trauma and the abuse in my life so I've just kept speaking out. It's, it's, there's been a price I've paid for it. It's impacted my career in terms of music because people didn't want to hire me because they think all I'm going to talk about is depression. And that's not what I do. So, um, but it is what it is. So uh, here I am today. So um, any thoughts, Elizabeth? Am I, am I rambling too much? Because I was going to do another tune. Absolutely not. No, I think you covered so many things that are so true. And, and I know I've been in places as well where, you know, here I am coming to tell my story, but they want me to omit the word sexual abuse, molestation, and rape. 
and uh, I too uh, was diagnosed with CPTSD that affected certain things as well, along with some other mental health things. And but you're right. I mean, people do want to silence you, and I just I I have to say kudos for you for for not letting them muffle you. And I think uh, that's encouraging to the rest of us and and everybody that would be listening. Absolutely. And I know it's hard. And I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a firm believer in saying something, but I also mindful that you don't have to just support those yes. that are, because it can impact your career, can impact so many mm-hmm. things. So I am very aware that it can, so tread cautiously, but you know, again, go to where the silence is and say something. And if you can't because yeah. of your situation, your circumstances, just try your level best to support those that are. This next tune is um, Black Rain. And this is off my pirate CD. And uh, well, <laughs> the song speaks for itself, but I wrote this when I was in such a horrible depression. Uh, I, I never understood how depression could just kick the living crap out of you. And now I know better. I understand why people, we've lost people to suicide, uh, turning to drugs, alcohol, all the rest, because man, depression is, yeah, it's a killer. Um, Obviously, learn ways to get through it because I'm here, but this is where this song came from. Understanding a life without this pain, a life of seeing something beyond this black rain.
I love it. <laughs> no. <laughs> what I've learned. <laughs> we can heal from depression. We can. We're here. I think most of us have probably gone through it, depending on in the level of the of its pain and intensity. Um, it's a killer. And it impacts the mind, the body, and the spirit. That's why when someone says it's a mental illness, I'm like, oh my God, it's physically draining it. I am a firm believer in exercise that has helped me to heal. There were days when I was so depressed, I'd go out to walk and every step was painful. I'd have to turn around and go back. So um, uh, yeah, that was a lesson learned because uh, I just never understood depression because uh, siblings of mine and others were dealing with it long before I did. Now I walked in those shoes and I have a better understanding and empathy for those that are going through it. And then mindful that um, our depression is also shaped by, for me, it was all the losses and the grief. I had to deal with the loss of um, I had a successful music business, but then the PTSD and the depression came in. I couldn't sustain my business anymore. I couldn't drum on the weekend. I was drumming every weekend with a band. Um, that was depressing. And in a few years, my ex, my partner of 21 years divorced me because she didn't think that I was ever gonna get better. So that was, that just put me, that's where this song came about because I was just in a deep dark hole that I did not think I was gonna climb out of it again. And Slowly but surely, um, you know, we do, but it, it, it's, it's, it's hard work. So that was a lesson to be learned to just keep chipping away, but uh, it's draining. Um, That's such a great reminder too, because boy, when we're in the depths of that despair and depression, it's hard to think that we're ever going to get out of that pit. And you're right. And what was also lessons learned was the lack of, um, because so most folks are trauma informed, but they're not trauma practicing in terms of counselors. The same with the medical professionals that we're going to see. And then I also learned a lot of um, mental health counselors. Um, a lot of them have had trauma. That's why they come to the, you know they're trying to help and heal, which is great. But many of them have not healed themselves. So in the they end up hurting us all over again because they're just bringing their crap into that office. And I didn't know, I, I didn't know about mental health. I didn't know about depression. I didn't know about PTSD. I didn't know about complex PTSD, anxiety, all that. I hadn't, hadn't a clue. I, so that's why I became a firm believer in taking hold of my healing journey and reading every, every book and every article I could get my hands on, on healing from trauma and depression. Um, I wanted, I wanted to beat this thing. So uh, that was a lesson learned. I, I just, again, we've come a lot farther and most folks cannot afford to see the better trauma practicing councils. We've had this discussion here. So I just hope someday that that, that paradigm changes. I've learned um, again from learning all because the knowledge is the power that has helped me in my healing. Um, and what has helped me, uh, Music, obviously, you know, but there was a time in depression that music just sounded like a bunch of noise. I, I couldn't listen to music. Nature, I, I get immersed in nature, exercise, the creative arts and all their forms. Learning about food, learning about something simple as orange juice and walnuts, they contain things in it that will help you with depression. It's not gonna cure you. So I became an avid reader on learning everything I could put into my body that was healthy. And don't get, I still eat pizza. I'll still pick up a beer once a week. So it's not like I'm a, I'm a monk with this, but um, yeah. So learning, again, these are lessons I had to learn. And so much of it, I had to learn on my own or through, from peers or meeting with other survivors, attending survivor support groups, uh, whether that was for depression or whether it was for, for child, you know, sexual abuse or child abuse. Um, this next tune is Pirates. And this is the title track of um, my second CD, uh, Pirates. And this was my way of, um, for myself, but also talking to others that we are the masters of our own ship. Um, yeah, 
Many times the crew may abandon the sails, but darn it, we can still get there. Um, just, you know, it's hard and nothing is easy, but I still believed in the hope that we could find a way in our healing journey to get to where we need to go. So this is Pirates. Then I'm gonna pause and if folks, conversation, questions, um, I have more songs. If we don't get to the songs, I'll mail them to, so, um, you know, We'll just play it by ear. So this will be pirates, and we'll I'll share a few things and we'll chit chat. That sounds great, Michael. And you're so you know, you're so right about just soaking up everything you can to learn and grow and, and that sort of thing. And and I still learning. <laughs> I have an extensive library of self-help books and and all the famous, you know, obviously it's, the Bessel van der Kolk. It's like why, isn't it? There's a gazillion others that have also written incredible books that were writing stuff back in the 70s and 80s. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.
boy who set sail in them Hawaii chose to leave the place. So that um, that was my song to cover the <laughs> being estranged, <laughs> cut off, abandoned, <laughs> on our own, but yet mindful that we're the masters of our own ship. At least I am for me. I can't tell anyone else what to think or feel. Um, and it's our, our healing journey. And one of the things I've learned, um, survivors regardless of the trauma and abuse you've been through in life and mental health challenges, one thing I've learned is down at you're all uh, heroes in, in my estimate, because you've gone through hell and then some, the resiliency in you, you may not see that, but I've just, um, I've been all over and it's, it's, it's like mind boggling. If people really spent some time to hear what you've been through as a child, as an adult or whatever's gone on. I mean, you, every one of us could write a book. I mean, so you know, you know, the pat on the back, you know, acknowledging that. So yeah, um, for those that their family and friends stuck with them, great. But I've learned that too many, we've been cut off. We've been, you know, you know, ostracized. So the fact that uh, you get through this and, and you're showing up day in, day out, uh, that to me is, uh, you know, showing great courage. And I salute you for that. And one of the things I had to learn for myself was um, as a child, I used to wait for, you know, for Batman and Superman to come through the door with a Lone Ranger or Davy Crockett. They weren't coming. I had to become my own hero. No one was going to rescue me. So, uh, and another thing with the pirates for me, and again, I write for the collective universe, but I also write, but the songs are a message to me. It's reminding myself what I have to do. Um, safety is key. Uh, I was not going to heal if I wasn't feeling safe. And I've learned that for so many of us, if healing is going to be impeded, if we're in environments or situations where we feel unsafe. And the first time that I ever experienced really truly feeling safe in my life uh, was at the age of 21. At the age of 21, I was a professional drummer. I was in a touring rock band. I went overseas to Great Britain. I had this whole ocean protecting me from my perpetrators. That was the first time I felt safe. And so for those two years, my life as a musician thrived better because I did not have them around me. It was just, it was much nicer. So safety is paramount for all, for all of us, whatever. Um, so I've learned that so many of us, we've gone through soul crushing trauma Many of us have been unloved. That's going to have a huge impact on your healing. Again, great if you have family and members that friends that have supported you, but a lot of us grew up, we were not loved by our parents or caregivers. Um, I've learned that unfortunately some survivors can hurt one another. Something I've also learned about what impacts intensifies our respective trauma. The earlier in life that it occurs, <laughs> the more severe the likely long-term effects. Learning that deliberate violence is particularly damaging, especially when it's inflicted by our caregivers, our trusted caregivers. And violence compounded by betrayal, silence, blame, or shame impacts our ability to form intimate relationships. And that's something we've had on this discussion. So, um, Trauma impact, that's why my platform has always been addressing trauma. Uh, because one of the things I've learned is, yes, childhood sexual abuse does a horrible thing to us. It affects our brain development, the nervous system, but so does physical abuse, so does emotional abuse and neglect. So that's when I said to not compare because for someone, thank goodness, if they weren't sexually abused as a child, but their trauma as a child, if they were physically abused or emotionally abused and neglected, it's had the same imprint on their nervous system. And again, I'm not a doctor. I only learned these things from reading the books and the literature and this in the respective studies. So um, safety and connection <laughs> helps us to create healing. And down at 
we're worth it, we deserve it. So um, with that, I, I'll, I'll open it up here. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Michael. And I agree with you, you know, all abuses, it, it doesn't matter what it is. And, and oftentimes, too, when it's, uh, you know, it might start out as sexual abuse, but then we end up uh, going into maybe drug and alcohol addictions and entering into abusive relationships, maybe marrying into having troubles with uh, uh, authority figures and this sort of thing. So it's just a whole array of different symptoms and everything else. But with that, um, uh, let's open it up. Does anybody have questions or comments? And I see that a lot of, let's see, uh, Joanne wrote, I stand in solidarity with you, Michael. Thanks for being you. Kendra wrote, thanks for the platform. Oh, did I miss something? Oh, I thought you were pointing at me, Michael. Uh, let's see. I was going for the water bottle. Going for the water. Well, you get to do that. Uh, let's see. Good for you, said Kelly. Congratulations, said Murray. Uh, let's see. Uh, Amanda writes, thank you, Michael. Maybe I'm a crybaby, but lots of tears here. I don't think that's being a crybaby. I think you're feeling the music and the words and, and it's bringing up things. And, and that's the power of music, right? It makes us feel, it makes us think and, and that sort of thing. Um, let's see, Kendra had written, it's no longer about resiliency and humanity at this point. The justice system simply has yet to do anything knowing there's massive profits due to abuses. What do you say to those of us who are still the targets because we speak out from city, state, or FBI? Where's a safe zone when we can't cross the pond? Where's, uh, <laughs> I don't have all the answers. I've, um, as an advocate, I've had many things said targeted at me, um, I found my safety in my home. I, I find it in my backyard. I, I, um, I feel safe in, in my little home, in my little backyard. So I find safety in nature. I find safety in the top of a mountain. I find it in the woods. I find it in amongst friends. So that's where I find safety for me. I, I can't, um, and I'm sorry that's what you're going through, Kelly, uh, but perhaps just find, looking outside uh, other places to get away from them. It's okay to get away from them as best you can. Well, and a lot of us too, when we think about this, a lot of us, like you had mentioned earlier, Michael, that a lot of us just don't have the support systems within our own family units. So then it means go, going outside of the family and maybe um, you know, I'm, I'm the same as you. It's, it's nature. It's getting, you know, those are the type of safety. I, I think uh, knowledge is power. So for me, books could be a safe thing because I'm learning and growing. Um, but also too, Kendra, um, you know, if you can find uh, good peer support, uh, whether it's through Empower Survivors or another organization, there's a lot of great organizations out there now that are offering peer support. Uh, sometimes that will give you a little bit of, you know, just being in a community with survivors and people that get it and learning and growing that way uh, is a great thing too. Uh, let's see. It's within reporting the organizations, etc. Has anyone dealt with actual corruptions? 80 to 85 percent of child trafficking is done by organized crimes through this. Um, unfortunately, uh, they do. Uh, I. I cannot stop that. All I can do is raise my voice with other survivors. There are organizations at that conference in Georgetown, and then there was a follow-up. I met FBI, I met CIA people, State Department, UNP. There was a, there's a lot of people addressing it. It's just the problem 
is so huge. So, um, and I'm sorry, I said, Kelly, it was Kendra that was asking that. So uh, we just keep needing to raise our voices. Uh, and yes, there is corruption, but uh, I haven't given up. I've, I've seen corruption every, in every facet. I've seen organizations that are here to help survivors, you know, hurt survivors. So we just Absolutely. keep speaking out. We, you know, it's just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. I do less of it. I'm older. There's a lot of great people now speaking out. Uh, we just need more collective voices. We need more survivors showing up at the events when people are holding a rally or a conference or something speaking out at it. I used to go up to the state house up here in uh, New Hampshire. My first advocacy was with a little nonprofit called the New Hampshire Incest Center, and they were very, very small, but they they did a lot of great things. Um, and I was up there with them holding the you know the placket and speak, but there'd be twelve of us. I mean, and you know damn right well there's more survivors in New Hampshire, and it was well the news was covering it and all the rest of it, where we got a lot of um, bang for buck, if you will. We would have conferences and we had people like Bessel van der Kolk and Anna Salter come in and speak. Then we'd have a full conference because all the councils and everybody's coming in to get their CEUs. But at the state house, it was just, you know, anywhere from six to 12 of us. I've gone to many walks um, for survivors. You know, if you get 50 to a couple hundred, you're doing great. You go to the cancer, or mental, it's, it's swarming with thousands. That's the problem and survivors um i understand it's painful and hard but survivors have to come to these events they have to come to these events because the rest of the world so the there's power in numbers um we saw what happened with the black lives matter i mean there was a collective entity we need those moments um i used to go um i wasn't abused in a catholic church setting i was abused in a con congregational church but i would go down to boston or even right here in manchester new hampshire i would go support my survivor friends who were abused by uh, the clergy the priests and i'd you know at best maybe there was 10 to 20 of us um and people are coming out of the churches of the events and they're telling people you know telling the survivors get over it grow up get a life you know <laughs> and what people were trying to raise awareness so it ain't easy it is not easy, but um, we just keep chipping away. Uh, and I wish Absolutely. I had better answers. I, 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 that, that has been a conundrum, how to get more involvement. Um, and I see that with the bigger organizations. You know, I, you know uh, Male Survivor, One in Six, there's a ton of great organizations and you know, they need more help. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's, there's some really great people running those organizations, but still getting more participation. Um, yeah, I, I wish we could. I wish we could get thousands of people to wash on walk on Washington D.C. I've been involved with um, uh, walks, demonstrations on the Capitol for mental health mistreatment, and all the rest of it. And I think the most we ever had was seven or eight hundred from around the country. And and there were some pretty heavy duty people speaking and attending it, but there's just not enough of us, seven or 800, you know, on the mall, you know, that's, that's a lot of people, but it's, it's a drop in the bucket. So, um, well, statistically, that. what's that? Statistically, can you imagine if every person that was sexually abused just within the United States, I mean, that's not even counting worldwide. But can you imagine if you went to Washington, D.C.? They, I mean, we'd be taken over a place. It would be unbelievable. Yeah, one in four, so, one in six, mm -hmm. and flood the place. All right, I see a bunch of hands. I think I should. Yes, uh, Stacy Stacy was first, then Thomas, and then Amanda. So Thomas, or I mean, uh, Stacy, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, I think you're muted there, Stacy.
Oh, for some reason we can't hear you, Stacy. Oh shoot. Should we go on to somebody else while you try and fix it? Okay, Thomas, question or comment? Um, yeah, uh, I have some experience of being in the media and standing up against the Roman Catholic Church and being a lobbyist and going and speaking to policymakers. And it's super, super complex. Um, I spent a whole lot of time in my interviews with the media trying to convey that one in four girls and one in four boys are sexually abused and that what we need to do as a society is to look in our own backyard as we need to get information out there about how uh, to see how to see a groomer and how to receive a child when they come to you and i would start a re-interview talking like this and inevitably the blurb or the 30 seconds on TV was Tom was raped by a Catholic priest. And it, it's this sensationalism which sells and this is what we're up against. And I found that when I got caught up in the reality of the media and the politics that are so far out of my control, it got me deeper in depression because it really, really made me feel helpless because I can see the abuse of power in all walks of life. I, I can see it in myself, how, you know, how I can um, be in a position of power and I don't quite know how to be in that the best possible way. And wh when I put my focus onto things that Michael was speaking about, um, getting out in nature, focusing on my diet, focusing on creative endeavors, then my focus went internally and it helped me to reorganize myself so I could be in the world in a much uh, more balanced way and to see things the way they are and to be able to respond to them and, and not react to them. And so I, I just really appreciate what you were sharing, Michael, about how it's, there's so many different facets we can work on um, from getting our diet, the joys of cooking, drawing, journaling, getting out and rolling around in the grass and the sand, playing with the dog, that takes our mind away from what we can't control. Because in a real way, I was feeding back on myself and actually becoming my own abuser by trying to change things out of my control or thinking I had some control. And it took me a long time to learn that lesson and now when I look at media, I, I, I see it from afar. And it, it just doesn't bring me down. And I go for a walk or I pick up my guitar and, you know, it's, it's different. It's really this whole idea that my world changes and the world changes when my insides get organized and balanced. Yeah. That's all yeah, I have to I, say. Thank you, Todd. I, um, as you were saying that, I remember when I was in an apartment after the divorce, uh, I'd have friends over and I'd say, let's have a get together, but let's have a mental health break day. Let's not talk about the meds and all. Let's just have, let's just get together as human beings. So yeah, it's, so yeah, because have a life beyond our survivor history. We're more than what was done to us or our experiences. We're, we're complete human beings. So I, I agree. Thank you, Thomas. That's so important. Uh, we are more important than that. Uh, Stacy Ray, did you want to try your question or comment again? Oh, I still can't hear you. Well, All right. Nice. Sorry. Uh, Amanda, did you have a question or a comment for Michael? Um, yeah, I just, I won't say which state I'm in. I'm not in a huge state, but, you know, I just always fear going to things like that because of the media, because I've already been majorly traumatized and I don't want my family to know because I don't want more trauma. And I believe that I would be more traumatized by my family and I, and maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe more family members would believe me, but I always fear that. So, I mean, do you think that that kind of contributes to how many people show up to things and 
that um, absolutely because you know you're absolutely right because as i i think i said earlier you know being mindful who does speak out and when you can but how somehow how you can support maybe it's just sending a check to an organization because you're absolutely correct i decided to do it i have paid a price for that amanda um uh my teenage kids were upset that I was in the in the news. My ex was when we were at, she she didn't want it. She um, but uh, so yeah, you, you do pay a price. I had friends that wouldn't have anything to do with me anymore. So you're absolutely right. It's it's tough. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. <sighs> yeah. But yeah. Everything. Everything in in me you know, always wants to get involved, but then I'm like, no, I can't because I don't, I just don't want to deal with the re-traumatization and maybe that's selfish, not caring about others, but I just feel like I don't want more trauma added onto it. Uh, you, and I honor that. And I think all of us do, you on, do what's best for you and then find a way that you can support those that are doing it. And however that may be, just maybe sending an email saying, thank you for what you're doing. That, 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 that has power right there. That's support. Cause so I do hear you and I, I support you in, as in your decision, why you're not doing that. I, 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 I get that. And I do too, Amanda. And I'll tell you what, you know, if you think about it too, um, one, not everybody is able to speak out or to be able to do these things. And everybody's at a different place in their own healing journey. There is a day, Amanda, that there is no way I would ever come out about my abuse. I mean, I even, you know, now, of course, I'm at a different place. But I was like, Michael, where, you know, you, you didn't necessarily have family or friends that supported you and and for me um what was good for me or how i did it might be different than another survivor and the way that michael does it may be different than another survivor and wherever it wherever all of us are at and our different points of the healing journey and what we do and what we don't do um that's where you, that's where each person is at and and so you know it's important that we don't judge each other like that Mm -hmm. Stacy, did you figure out your audio yet? Okay, somebody wrote, let's see, Joanne wrote, I do a training on pros and cons of disclosure and non-disclosure on coming out with a mental health challenge in varying settings. Maybe a mental list to yourself or with a therapist or trusted person personal list of your own pros or cons of disclosure for this specific issue. Good idea. Uh, somebody else asked, and I'm not sure if it was Kendra, how do I put my hand up to raise for an audio question? <laughs> you know, go ahead. You can ask right now. I'll let you. Uh, Maria jump has in a here. hand up. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Maria, did you want to Ask the um, question yeah, trying or comment. To, yeah, I was trying to get my face on here, but I'm I'm on my phone and I'm anyway. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to be that funny blob. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, in response to what Amanda was saying and everybody else, just about you know when and if you're ever ready. It's it's obviously up to that person and just for whatever it's worth for my story. You know, I just kept writing my story because I wasn't sure if I'd ever share it or not. But for me, writing was one of those things that was very healing. I, I didn't realize I was doing it for that, but it was. And, you know, it literally was 12 years later when I did finally publish my book. But even up until two months before, I didn't know if I was going to put my name on it. I didn't know, you know, I still had all these fears, but it, you know, it still is a process and you never know where you might be, but never be hard on yourself because you feel like you're not doing, you know, you're not like what I forget the word you just said, Amanda, but um, you know, you are, and like Michael said, just giving, just saying to somebody, you appreciate what they did is huge. Cause when those of us who are trying to do something, sometimes we never know if it's of any use to anybody. And it's, and those little bits and pieces keep us going too. So it's sort of, you know, you're, you're pushing us along as well, even if you're not out there speaking about your own story. So that's my two cents, I guess. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Okay. Did you want to do some more songs or are there any more thoughts or? Uh, Kendra, did you want to jump in and ask a question quick? I know you were asking how to raise your hand. I was trying to uh, figure out how I could explain it to you here. I thought if you went over to participants and then click on your name and then uh, under more, maybe there's a spot where it says raise your hand. It I'm should be sure. just under more. If you mm -hmm. hit more, then it should say raise hand. Unless she has a different, unless you have different than me. I have an iPhone. Okay. Okay, Kendra. Um, if you want to jump in, you can now. Otherwise, we'll have Michael play some more music for us. Oh. Uh, Kendra's mic isn't working, so Michael, why don't we go ahead and have you play some more music for us. All right. Um, and I knew I would run out of time to do the, <laughs> the fourth song, so I'll close with the final two. Um, one is titled Joy and the other one's titled By My Side, but I was going to do the song Sorrow, which is off of Pirate CD, and that song addresses, and again, I'll mail the MP3s to... Um, Elizabeth, and she can share them with you folks. Uh, that song addressed, you know, the people. I, there was a time that I don't ask it anymore, but when I'd be doing these conferences and I'd say, how many have heard the phrase, just get over it? It's in the past. Mm -hmm. and I, I guarantee you, most of the hands went up in the room. But what I learned, again, this is lessons learned, that how the trauma, again, I mentioned this earlier, it's hardwired into our system. It's in our mind and body and spirit. We just can't get over it because if anyone wanted to just get over it, it would have been me. And uh, it doesn't happen that way. Um, so one of the things I've learned, uh, a lot of survivors, they don't want to acknowledge their trauma for many reasons. Um, I know folks, I know folks as friends, they they know that they were sexually abused as a child, but they want to take their mental health label. Um, they want to be schizoaffective. They want to be all the, they do not want to address that. And that's their choice. And I think it's because what we're talking about is there's a pushback. There's a stigma. There's a price you pay. I've learned as a male, as a male survivor, there is pushback still not as much as it was when I started from females, not wanting us in the arena. Uh, I, I, and so many others would call the places, domestic violence, sexual assault centers for help. And, well, we don't treat males or some of them were even being told that well, males are perpetrators. That was the mindset. We've come a long way. So there's still that. I've, I've learned um, there's still a big pushback that people do not want to hear about female abusers and especially from females. Um, uh, females do abuse. Uh, my mother was one of my main abusers. <laughs> she was a pedophile, period. Um, so these are some things we're moving forward in small incremental steps, but we're getting there. The next song I was going to do uh, was called Walk With Me. And this was my anger and sadness song because here I was dealing with all this trauma and abuse that just devastated my life. And all I kept hearing is you're mentally ill. You'll never work again. You'll never do this. You'll never, you know, they had me on a regimen of drugs and I'm not anti-medication. I'm anti-over-medication. I was not psychotic. I did not need to be on antipsychotics, et cetera, et cetera. I was told that I would never be in music again, or maybe I could volunteer in a library that had a music section. Um, I told them I wanted to learn to play the guitar and sing. Oh, you'll never be able to do that. Well, um, <laughs> I've released three CDs and I've been all over the country. So these are the things I'm, I'm sharing this because these are lessons I've learned. This still goes on today. I met a young woman several weeks ago, only a few months into the depression, anxiety. She's already at the mental health center and they already have, already have her on 10 meds. Uh, again, I'm mindful medication helps so many people but there's something wrong with that picture within two or three months someone's on 10 medications for, for, for mental illness so 
Um, we still have a lot of ways to go with that. I've learned that sometimes the efficacy is lost for, you know, it's 50 to 60%. Then for folks like myself, they were toxic. They caused my suicidal ideations. They caused me to try to end my life. I stopped taking those meds. I don't need, I don't feel I, I need to end my life anymore. So there is a price to that. And again, there's no cookie cutter approach to healing from whatever your mental health challenges or the trauma or the abuse in your life. Um, so let's get to joy. So this, um, I was talking with Elizabeth earlier before we started. Um, I used to close all my events with the song Stand By Me and it was my way of giving thanks. You're hearing me say about the people that pulled away. But I've also always have given thanks to those who stood by me and those all the new peers and friends that I met. So um, this song, Joy, is part of that is to address that. And then I have one more after that. So this is, um, I'm drawing a blank what CD this is off of. Maybe Pirates, maybe Wait for a Train. <laughs> but So there you go. It's called Joy.
feel like we should be like, woohoo! Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously I write, it runs the gamut of what, you know, for songs. It, you know, it's, I'm capturing, you know, Maria's written a book. Other people journal, you know, their art. I do the hard stuff. I also do the joy. I have songs about love. I have songs about peace of mind, serenity. So, you know, we're at, we're all, we're creative. We do different things. So um, one of the things, a huge lesson for me though, in healing was learning to forgive myself. This song was written after, um, uh, it's a miracle I'm here. I, I mentioned um, suicide ideation. I had a couple really serious uh, attempts, intent on my life. Uh, so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I don't take that lightly. Learning to forgive myself for that. Learning to forgive myself when I was married and I was the workaholic. And yes, I was a good dad and a good husband to a point, but I was gone a lot. I was a provider, a good provider. Um, also forgiving myself for not being connected to my friends fully um, when they wanted to get together, when they wanted to go fishing or hunting. I always had more work to do. Um, hindsight, I really didn't. Um, I didn't need to. It's just I couldn't sit still. I didn't know that back then. I didn't have the tools I have today. So learning to forgive myself. We all need to learn to forgive ourselves. I don't buy that I have to forgive my perpetrators. I don't. Those that want to, that's your choice. Uh, but for me, it's learning to forgive myself. I'm going to close with the tune by my side. Again, this is my way of giving thanks to the friends, the peer support, my new family that I've met, and that I, you know, taking chances with trust. You know, all of you that I get to interact with, we're peers. We be, some of us become friends, and you know, it just it just keeps going on. So by my side, and I know you all know the chorus. So hum along. Oh, 
That was awesome. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kinder Road, thanks for sharing your thoughts and music and your journey to this point, Michael. I just wanted to make sure and get that in there. Well, and again, I thank you all for being here. I, um, your time is valuable. Um, thank you for honoring me, honoring Elizabeth, and, and being here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Well, I have, you know, thank you so much, uh, Amanda Rowe. Love this song tonight. It's been a huge support and blessing for me that I extremely needed. I had a horrible weekend, and today was horrible, too. Well, I'm sorry it was horrible, Amanda, but it is. you're right. I mean, getting together and, and doing things like this and having Michael's sing to us and, and this sort of thing, it's it's just, it's nice. It's It's relaxing. It's nice. It's it's just a great way to connect and to come together as a survivor community. And so I, I just thank you so much, Michael, for taking time out of your night here tonight uh, and being with all of us here. I really appreciate it. I love all the work that you do. And I know that even for, for me, you, you've helped out in, in many ways and uh, been a, oh, <laughs> Amanda wrote in, this has to happen another Monday night. Well, it looks like you're going to be busy, Michael, because we're going to need you back. <laughs> um, um, Amanda, that song, By My Side, it's at my YouTube channel. I did a live version right in my living room. I call it Live at the River Ledge. So you can find it there. And my YouTube channel is uh, MCS Train, you know, which is my name. And, you know, so... Uh, but again, I'll send uh, Elizabeth the links, but... How do you spell train? Uh, T-R-A-I-N. So it's um, youtube.com slash user slash MCS train. MCS is my name, Michael Cameron Skinner. Train was the band that I toured Great Britain with. And then in the 70s and early 80s. So we had the name before the very popular band today. Um, so that's why I still, <laughs> that's why my first album, Train of Tears, I've got songs about trains. The third album was one. Waiting for a Train. I've always had a love <laughs> for trains. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you can Thanks yeah, you to can you, find I them. have them both. Okay. <laughs> and where can they purchase these if they wanted to? If you want to purchase my CDs, that would be great. <laughs> um, there's lots of music and there's a little booklet, maybe... Elizabeth, give a little blur, but um, right at my website, mskinnermusic.com. Um, and I think I put that up in the top part. Yeah, mskinnermusic.com. Um, mm -hmm. Thomas yep, Travis has a raised hand. What did you say? Elizabeth, Thomas's oh. hand is raised. Oh, well, there you go, Thomas. We better get to you then. Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Michael, for reminding me of something and how easy it is for me, for us to get caught up in knowing things or information and the difference between experiencing something. And it's written all over your demeanor in these moments of what the experience of music does for you. And it's contagious. And, and how important it is for all of us just to get out and do something. Whether it's go out and walk in nature, go out and turn on music and dance every day for five days in a row to experience what it is. And there's a huge difference between knowing that music is good for us and creating that experience for ourselves. We don't have to be musicians but we can move to it. We can have it in the background all the time. It changes our consciousness. 
I agree. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. And that's why I dance every night while I'm cooking dinner and listening to music. <laughs> I can't sing a tune to save my life, but the cats don't mind it. <laughs> Is that dancing like okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might not be the best dancer either, but you know, when I'm dancing, I'm feeling like I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> I'd like to share a couple things. Um, you'll be brief, and but again, keep the conversation going. I um, it's a daily reading to myself because as far along as I've come in healing, I still struggle. I still have days that are down. I still dissociate, but it's not days on end. It's not weeks. Um, it comes, it goes. I've learned to sit with it. Uh, the mindfulness, I've stopped fighting it. I don't like dissociation, but there are times something emotionally charges me, triggers me, and sends. Um, sometimes I don't even know where it's coming from. I've learned to sit with it. I don't like it. But this is something that I've been doing for myself for the last 20 some odd years, and I read it daily to myself. When I would be really struggling, I used to read it three or four times a day to remind me and I'm a human being. And this is what I, I have down. It's a little piece of paper. And I used to have it in my wallet and I have it tacked up in my room. Now it's in, in a little book that I look at every morning. I'm a good person. I'm creative and resourceful. I work hard. I'm caring of others. This will pass. Wait. The bad thoughts and feelings are untrue. Breathe, ground myself, distract. I've learned, I said, no major decision making when depressed. I deserve love, life, peace, and happiness. Journal. And the final one that I say to myself every morning how would I deal with conflict or stress if this was the last day of my life? Um, so, as much as I've um, been at this since 1993, and actually in the 80s, attending adult children of alcoholics um, meetings, support groups, that was my first in with peer support, um, I have to remind myself that I'm worth it to stay on this healing journey. So thank you. I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, Denise wrote that this is an excellent uh, this is excellent. Thank you for reading and sharing. You are such an inspiration. Grateful our paths have crossed. And Joanne wrote, thank you for that. And and thank everybody. Thank you, uh, Michael, for being here with us tonight. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our time here. But thank you so much for, again, taking time out of your day and, and being here uh, with the rest of us. And thank you to everybody who showed up tonight because this is what makes this a great community is because of people, everybody coming together like this and, and sharing some time together and having conversation, having music, having, you know, learning, growing, and this sort of thing. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of this program here tonight. I invite you to learn more about Empower Survivors at www.empowersurvivors.net. Uh, next Monday, we will have as our guest, Mel Langston. Uh, she is from, she's a CEO and author and from an organization called Mozak, uh, Mothers Against, oh, what is it? Mothers Against Sexual Assault. Something. I don't know. I'll have to get that out there. So I can't remember that acronym. But and then also uh, Thursday evening, we, we will have our regularly scheduled peer support group, uh, six o'clock central time, seven o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Mountain, four o'clock Pacific. So if you're up to gathering as a survivor community, uh, those are where you can connect with us. Uh, also, you can find us in many groups and Facebook. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. I hope you all have a great rest of the night and a great rest of the week. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Thank you so much.